Good morning, everyone. Uh, hopefully, at this point, you can uh, see Augie and I here. And I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to Summer Learning Academy 2021, uh, Inclusive Education Success for All Learners. For our second 100% online Summer Learning Academy this year, the majority of us are in the province of Nova Scotia today. So we would like to begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kmaq, ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Pendant notre deuxième école de formation pendant l'été, 100% en ligne, la majorité de nos participants sont en Nouvelle-Écosse aujourd'hui. Donc, nous voudrions commencer en soulignant que nous nous trouvons en Mi'kmaq, le territoire ancestral des Mi'kmaq. I have a couple of notes here before uh, we get on with the keynote, and I don't want to take too much time from that. I do want to remind everyone to create your personal schedules uh, in the uh, platform. That's going to allow us uh, a little bit of flexibility in uh, uh, arranging um, uh, the, the credits and so on uh, behind the scenes. Those aren't things you need to know about. I probably shouldn't have even mentioned it. But the reminder is to create your personal schedules. That's what's important. Um, there are accessibility and language features available on the portal, and uh, you can pop out the video uh, in a standalone player if that makes it better for you. Uh, you can find help from us and from the uh, SLA team in the public lobby chat or in uh, by sending an email to sla.help at gnspez.ca. Uh, those are two options available to you. Uh, at the end of each session, there is a feedback form available. Uh, we've had a couple of pre-conference days of great sessions and I anticipate two and a half more days of uh, really uh, wonderful sessions with great presentations. Don't forget the closing keynote uh, featuring Maggie McDonald, uh, McDonnell, and uh, our Deputy Minister, Kathy Montroy, uh, on Friday morning. Uh, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge the immense work of the SLA team um, that's uh, Lael Radke, Chris Jones, Nick Basquill, Steve Power, and others. Uh, thank you all very much. Um, I've been preoccupied with some other things this year, so my assistance has been minimal at best. At this point, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague and friend, Augie Jones. Augie is the executive lead uh, responsible for the inclusive education policy. I'm sure he'll provide more information uh, about that and, and uh, perhaps even a correct title. Uh, <laughs> so uh, thank you very much everyone for attending and uh, it gives me great joy to welcome Augie. Thank you so much, Sandy. And just to, uh, Sandy, my audio is good from your end. Am I good to go? Very good here, Augie, thanks. Okay, perfect. So good morning to everyone. I'm actually uh, in Hamilton, Ontario this morning uh, on uh, vacation, but I was not going to uh, miss um, this session with educators and, and I'm always so proud to be call myself a teacher and an educator and uh, getting together with other people. I think that we obviously people who aren't in the education field have a vision of our summer vacations. I don't know if they know how much teachers and educators and administrators work on their craft in the summer, you know, and, and this is part of that. Um, I also want to acknowledge that we are on Mi'kmaq, and, and, and I say that not as a land acknowledgement that needs to be said, it's a land acknowledgement that is logical, a land acknowledgement that um, speaks to First Nations, and, and I um, center myself as, as a settler, as someone who came to Mi'kmaq, uh, and of course from African descent. Uh, I want to welcome the 98 people uh, that are here. Uh, I'm going to, um, and, and the, with this platform, I'm going to uh, um, talk to my slides, uh, introduce some concepts, and a lot of this will be for people who have been in education. This is not new information. I think that this is an extension of, of so many things that we've been working on in Nova Scotia um, uh, for decades now. And so a lot of it will be trying to bring things together. And then I will um, stop sharing my, my screen at about um, quarter after. 
and and really uh, open up to some some short discussion. I, I will say that I wouldn't consider myself an expert. I would consider myself as someone who has um, been a teacher since 1992. Um, I'm a product of the Halifax school system. Uh, I did my BED at St. of X. I then went to teach in the Caribbean for 10 years. I also taught in the School of Ed at St. of X and uh, am now um, quite proudly working at the Department of Ed. And so I guess, you know, I have a lot of experience around education and, inclu and inclusive uh, concepts as well. And I think that's what I bring to the table. And, and what I'd rather do is hopefully at the end of this session, have people energized with questions and, and insights and, and feeling very motivated about what we've um, decided to take on uh, as far as an inclusive education policy for Nova Scotia. And, and I'll speak to that uh, a little bit later. But again, as, as Sandy said in the introduction, uh, uh, I've recently been in the role of executive lead inclusive education uh, in the province. Uh, and, and really in a short you know, description of that role, it's, it's to really, um, you know, COVID was a part of our development. It happened, I think, as Nova Scotia, we did a great job in our education system uh, um, adjusting to COVID. Uh, but yet that also meant that, you know, us really speaking about inclusive education and, and, and having what we may call a hard launch and, and get into the schools, um, it really got delayed a bit because of, um, uh, because of COVID. So part of me being in this role now is September 2021, you know, there's going to be a lot more um, type of marketing and, 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 and discussions around inclusive education. So, uh, and am I in slide? Hopefully, Sandy, I'm in slideshow mode here. Am I? Uh, we're seeing your slides. Yes, we're not seeing it in presentation mode. Okay, perfect. Um, so, uh, the Nova Scotia inclusive education vision, and I call it a vision because it's something that is is is, is a lofty goal. I think at some points it's a very utopian goal. But I also think that it's an appropriate goal that we as an education system in the first province, I would say, in the country that has taken on this wide perspective of um, inclusive education that is wider than inclusion, or as we know, with um, student services and, and that sense of the historical use of the word inclusion. And because of the way that we operate in Nova Scotia, and I'll get into that as we talk about the history, we've really expanded this um, inclusion vision to an inclusive vision and said, you know, why don't we try to make all students who are um, needing supports, um, needing, um, uh, you know, wellness support, academic support on a lot of different levels, um, why don't we try to accommodate everyone? And, and I often think, uh, and I'm not a business person, but I think that from the business world, they often try to accommodate all of their clients. Or if I'm an electrician and I go to someone's home, I don't really, through discretion, say, well, I'm not going to wire their house correctly. I figure that there are professions already that have this vision of we are going to try to accommodate all, all of our clients. And so I don't like to see to talk about students as clients, but they are our focus and they are the ones that are coming through our buildings from pre-primary to grade 12 and they're being and we're interacting with them as, as educational professionals so the inclusive education policy is again as we'll see it's a mix of a lot of things that we were already doing but it's really a focused mandate to say that we in this province from yarmouth to sydney we are trying to accommodate every single learner for academic success and for wellness every day that they come through the door that's utopian. And I would say that what we're going to talk about today as well is that this is not a policy. If we're honest about how education is, we can say at this moment in 2021, and this comes from comment from community, comment from first, per, first person with parents, with students, that not all students are feeling successful, not our, all students and families are feeling supported, not all students are feeling linguistically and culturally safe 
in and comfortable within our school system. That's not a criticism. That is something that we need to improve. And I think that when we take um, a, an inclusive education lens and we see it as being, oh, critical of the past, I don't think that's it. I think it's about improving in the future. I see it totally positive as we are getting better at what we do in our province. And I would say to you that our inclusive education um, policy, our vision, leads the country in this direction. And we also have, from hearing from Jess Whitley, who is one of the key researchers um, on our inclusive education rollout, and Andy Hargreaves, we've been getting global attention, worldwide attention around this um, attempt at inclusive education from a Nova Scotia perspective that is meant to accommodate all learners. So what you see on the screen right now is word for word, the introductory paragraph of the inclusive education policy. And, and I will read it, and I'm not one to read PowerPoint slides, uh, but I will say I will read this piece because it's a commitment. And again, every word in here I think is very important um, as far as what our vision is, but we are committing to ensuring a high quality, culturally and linguistically responsive and equitable education to support the well being and achievement of every student. And as we know from the recent pre primary announcement, that's fantastic news. We are also expanding what our school system looks like from beginning to end. So now, you know, we have a pre primary program that is five plus years old, and we know that we've got a large amount of funding to expand that. So now, when we think about our school public school system, we have to include pre primary right to grade 12. And so, of, of, is every single one of those students being serviced? and getting what they should be getting from a public school system. So all students should feel that they belong in an inclusive school. They should feel accepted, safe, and valued so they can best learn and succeed. And one thing I would say about Nova Scotia is we have a lot of teachers and maybe one of the highest population of teachers and administrators who have master's degrees and one of the things, and multiple master's degrees. And one of the things I find about that particular phenomena in our education system in the province is it, and I did my master's and I felt that it gave me time to reflect and, and think of new ideas and new ways of doing things and look at research and data. And so because of that, um, we know that students in the relational piece of learning is that when a student feels accepted, no matter who they are, when they feel safe, when they feel valued, the chances of them being successful at the end of grade 12, um, the chances of them meeting academic success and, and having opportunities in front of them are greatly um, uh, increased when they're feeling comfortable and well and safe in the school building from pre-primary to primary to one to two to junior high to high school. If that whole process involves parents, involves community, involves building relationships with all of the educational supports, professional adults that we have connected, then the chances of us being able to accommodate all students become much higher. So let me think about who is all, and, and, I, and I did take these statistics from the Department of Ed and, and wanted to put them out there, not to focus necessarily on every single number, but when you look at the total um, from the seven R regional centers of education, and of course, um, CSAP as our only you know, provincial school board, we're talking about 121 or over 120,000 students that we are saying right now, we are going to try to accommodate every single one of them. It's a huge task. It's a huge ask. It's a utopian vision. But I would say that most of the people on this call and on this session today would agree that that is our job as education, as educators. And if I, if I present it to you this way, I think we'll all get it even more. That's what I want for my two sons. That's what I want for my two sons. And so most parents who are on this session, who are also in education, know what it's like to send your child to a school building and you're hoping that what they get between eight o'clock and three o'clock is safety and support and respect and culturally responsive pedagogy for all students, no matter who they are. We all hope for that as parents. 
So now we're flipping that as educators and saying, are we accommodating the 1,000, sorry, the 121,600 students that are in um, that are in our school public school system? But if we desegregate the data, this is where the rubber hits the road as far as inclusive education policy goes. So now when we break it up by gender, we have more male students in our um, school system than we do female students. And also you can see that we're starting through self-identification to get students who are um, identifying as non-binary, right? And so that is where you see the X by gender. And we those numbers will increase as we do more self-identification. Another level to look at is because also we have gender issues around how education is rolled out for girls, how education is rolled out for boys, and how education is rolled out even more recently for those students that don't identify as either gender. And so how do they feel safe and, and supported and, and able to achieve academic success in those that first level of desegregation? And then we look at our French-speaking education, which is 65,000 strong. And obviously, when you look at the um, Acadian School Board, CSAP, you know, that is its own cultural space um, for French learners. But the numbers are also gigantic in, in our, um, you know, immersion programs. And looking at Halifax HRCE, we're seeing 28,000 students are engaging in French um, education. And again, as we start to desegregate this data, now we're starting to see with all of these differences, with all of this diversity, how do we accommodate 120,000 students who have these differences? And that's going to be my focus today. We also have a sense of um, uh, our African Nova Scotian and Indigenous learners, and we know that it hovers around five to six percent um, for both of those communities in our school system, which means if you flip it, that 95 percent or 94 percent of the students who are in most schools are not Mi'kmaq and are not African Nova Scotian. So quite clearly, I want to identify that these students who are African Nova Scotian or of African ancestry or Mi'kmaq or indigenous ancestry are minorities in our school system. The reason why I say that is I taught in Jamaica, I taught in Guyana, I taught in the Bahamas, I taught in St. Lucia. In these particular school systems, people of color were the majority. And so some of the dynamics that we deal with are because the indigenous and African Nova Scotian students that we that we speak of are in a minority situation. And I think that's where a lot of the um, inequities come from. And we have to acknowledge that. And we have as a system, don't get me wrong, we have a lot of improvement to do, but I will speak about the historical um, uh, documentation and data that we've already um, been immersed with in Nova Scotia around the history of indigenous learners and African Nova Scotian learners. But we also have students with disabilities, we have newcomers, we have um, students who are in two LGBTQIA+, and we also have students living in poverty that we have to accommodate. Um, I'm seeing, uh, I must say that I'm seeing my presenter view and I'm not seeing um, the screen as far as the slideshow. So I'm going to, go to the slideshow and we should be seeing equity, diversity, inclusion and a picture of the inclusive education policy. Uh, you can find this online in PDF form. As you can see, the approval date is August 2019 and um, the effective date or the, the kind of inter internal launch of this policy was September 2020. We also know that that was in the midst of our first full school year um, dealing with COVID. And so um, I'm not going to get into reading this document, but I will say that when you desegregate the data and all the different types of students we have, then the exercise of being inclusive becomes an exercise in can we build meaningful relationships with students in communities that don't look like us? 
whether that student is autistic, whether that student has Down syndrome, whether that student is a trans student, whether that student speaks French, whether the student speaks Syrian. We have so much difference in that 120,000 that that becomes our work is how do we as educators ensure that we are giving the same caring, same support, same perspective, setting the same high educational standards for every student when we know in society we are already dealing with Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, residential schools. We are, we are discovering graves of children that went to school who didn't come home. And so all of these things goes to show that our society is not equitable. So we have to be honest as educators to know that some of that, um, some of the thinking around racism, discrimination, homophobia, classism, um, um, seeing students who have physical disabilities is maybe lesser, seeing students who are on programming as, oh no, I've got this many students on programming. I know from being in teaching that we have that point of view and we have to clean that up and improve that point of view in order for us to serve all the diverse students who enter our building. And so, and I'm not sure if Cindy is on the call on the session today, but I work with, with Cindy at, at the ECD and, and she made a, a point probably about a month and a half ago when we were in a meeting, an MTSS meeting, and I thought it was a brilliant point, is that the Nova Scotia inclusive education policy is not a policy that we got from New Zealand or from, the states or from Australia or Britain. It's not that. It's the historic culmination of the voices of parents and community that said, I would like a better educational experience for my child who is learning disabled, who is blind, who is Mi'kmaq, who is female. There were so many ways that we were not serving certain students and for decades, parents have complained about that. Parents have wrote emails, parents have wrote letters, parents have protested, communities have protested. And so when we think about an inclusive education policy, it is actually from listening to those voices that it, it, it created um, a vision that said, we are committed to trying to serve all of the students that walk through our building. So I do want to frame it as though this education, inclusive education policy is actually us addressing the first voice um, um, feedback from the parents who are in the communities who are sending their children to our school, to our schools. So what are some of the concerns that have been, and these are intersectional concerns, right? These aren't concerns just of African Nova Scotian students. These aren't concerns of parents who have a child in a wheelchair. These are not concerns of a child who um, is going to the food bank at night and coming to school in the morning with no breakfast and no lunch money, right? If you look at some of these concerns, you will see that there's an intersectionality to how we can address them and, and I will get to that, to make sure that we serve all different students. So an equitable curriculum where students see themselves. And so we're saying that, our, like, and seeing themselves in all different ways. And again, we often attribute this to African Nova Scotian or Mi'kmaq, but it goes way beyond that, right? Our newcomers seeing themselves in curriculum. Our students who are dealing with disabilities seeing themselves in curriculum. So that's what we talk about with do we have an equitable, equitable curriculum? And, and I do know from working again with my colleagues at EECD that we are revising curriculum. We are expanding curriculum. We are taking in viewpoints that we hadn't done traditionally. So there's improvement happening. What are our relationships with the communities and the parents and the guardians, including children in care who enter our schools, right? And, and I can say quite clearly that the relationships, I can only speak from the African Nova Scotian community, has not always been positive with schools as far as do parents feel welcome? Do the people, and think about it as a teacher, most times nowadays you don't live in the community you teach. You drive into that community in the morning and you drive out of that community in the afternoon. And so there really has to be work done to make sure that you're linking with the community that you teach in. And that could be Cape Breton, that could be in the Valley, that could be in the South Shore. It doesn't matter what the community is, but we have to make what some of the 
the, the intersectional concerns of parents was the school doesn't know me, the school doesn't know our community. And so again, these are, when we think about the inclusive education policy, these are things that we want to address so that we are better serving all of our students. We can look at data around which students are on IPPs, which students are, are suspended the most, which students have low graduation rates, which students are in IB, which students are in advanced placement, which students are in French immersion. There's all kinds of ways that we can disaggregate the data to see that there would be communities that would be saying, I don't feel that the school system is supporting my son, my daughter. I don't feel that they are focused on the academic achievement of my son and daughter. And again, this is not a criticism, folks. It's not. It's a reality that is a global reality of inequity. So we in Nova Scotia are trying to address this through the education system by having an inclusive education policy. Opportunity gaps, and I have to really, you know, give um, my colleague Dr. Marlene Ruck Simmons, um, you know, the the credit for bringing this to my attention. Instead of achievement gaps, it's opportunity gaps. So we can say that there's lots of children that graduate with the type of transcript that brings them nothing. They can't go to community college. They can't go to university. They didn't know that while they were taking certain courses that were not academic, were they not at a certain level. So their opportunities are narrowed. So we would like in a utopian way that every grade 12 student, no matter who they are, goes through our school system and has a huge opportunity to do many things, whether I am blind, whether I am Mi'kmaq, whether, whether I am trans, whether I um, am autistic, I should be able to leave my school system at grade 12 with opportunities, career pathways. So it's not just that people graduate because a lot of people graduate who don't have opportunity or career pathways afterwards. Presence of diversity in the profession, are you seeing professionals in the building that look like you as a Syrian youth, as a, as a queer youth, as a um, African Nova Scotian youth? Are you seeing this diversity? Are you seeing it in senior management? Is there accommodation for languages beyond English? Because we know that Anglophones have a privilege in Canada. We do. And because we often are unilingual, Anglophones are probably the most unilingual people in Canada because we figure we only need English. But if we look globally, if we go to Europe, if we look even, you know, the people who are bilingual, French, most French speaking people can speak French and English. And so there's a, there's a privilege to an Anglophone perspective. And again, we have to look to improve that if we are going to accommodate all learners. Racism, discrimination, homophobia, we know that that exists in schools, and it's actually at the center of whatever bullying goes on. Because often bullying is one child looking at another child and finding a way to belittle them. So it could be their skin color, it could be their physical ability, it could be their sexual identity. Whatever way they can make them feel small often comes as a form of bullying. And we also know cyberbullying is there too. So these again are all concerns that have come out of the community. And so the inclusive education policy is saying, we are going to attempt to improve our addressing these concerns. In Nova Scotia, we have been addressing these concerns for decades, but we would like to improve that. So the inclusive education policy is not a criticism. It's about improving. Because if we look at the Black Report, which is one of the most classic pieces of educational research in the country, that's 1994, right? And that led to many things, but that's still a report that is decades old. We look at treaty education, that particular connection between treaty education and the province was signed in 2015, which is six years ago. We look at the students' first documentation, which was, again, great work around what are we doing in the province around inclusive education that supports the learning, especially of students who have disabilities and need supports in order for them to be successful. How are we doing with that? That is 2018. And we do know that the inclusive education policy flowed out of this fantastic document. And, and, and one of the questions that broadened it was, 
well, these are fantastic principles. Can we apply them to Mi'kmaq learners? Can we apply them to African Nova Scotian learners? Can we apply them to newcomers? And what we found was many of the inclusive principles of the student's first document could be applied. And that is what led to the expansion into an inclusive education policy. And then we know that Dr. Avis Glaze came to the school system and, and did a, did a, 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 a research um, kind of focus on how efficient we are, how equitable we are. And so there were many changes that were suggested based on that too. So I, I, I purposely put these other research documents to show a quick snapshot of them because it's a, it's a building and growing of these particular pieces of research over the decades that lead to an inclusive education policy. And so the graphic that you see now would be a lot of, of, of the foundations of what we're trying to do is that at the bottom of it, it's identity. So however my sons identify, and, and again, working with Dr. Marlene Rock Simmons in our, in our African Nova Scotian framework, one of the things that I think is applicable to all students is know them as they're known. Know them as they're known, their identity. And so when you accept someone for their identity, for their trans and queer identity, for their autistic identity, for their African Nova Scotian identity, for um, the fact that they're from the Philippines identity, anyone identity is a perfect place to start. And then we can build on equity and diversity and inclusion. And once we do that, we now have a student that walks into a grade three classroom, that walks into a junior high building who feels like they belong. That's huge. If you get students to feel like they belong, then they're opening up to learning, their resiliency, their ability to retain information and be able to give it back on tests and quizzes and exams. When you feel like you belong, those educational and cognitive processes happen a lot easier with that. And that could be Bloom's taxonomy speaks to that. There's, there's a lot of of, of, of ways that we know that how someone feels in their wellness and if they belong is connected to their educational ability. And so I do want us to, 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 to pause for a moment and, and, and again, place this conversation and the inclusive education policy as one, a culmination of community voices who are saying we would like an improved school system. I'm okay with that. So then what happens with us as educators is that we have to see this as a way of improving and becoming better rather than being criticized. So for example, I find that we're quick to upgrade our phones and update our software and our laptops. We always want topa topa. We always want it to be improved. Well, I would say use that same analogy for our, our school system. We should always be upgrading it. We should always be getting better. And we should be happy about getting better so that when someone says that um, students with disabilities are not being focused on in a positive way from a comprehensive point of view, that every single student who has disabilities in the province is walking into a school where they're known as they're known and they're accepted and they're supported. That's not a criticism. That's a reality that exists. And so we as educational professionals, Sorry, folks, we appear to be having a momentary technical difficulty. We'll be right back with you. Change with the way that they experience school from eight o'clock to three o'clock because they will become self actualized young adults, they will become productive adults, and then our society changes as far as discrimination, racism homophobia, xenophobia. If we have students that are having this inclusive experience from pre-primary to 12, that is going to make our Nova Scotia um, society better and improved in two decades. 
and from a Mi'kmaq perspective, seven generations, right? And this is what the inclusive education policy is about. It's not going to, I'm going to be dead and gone before it actually, we see the real fruits of this policy. But I've got to think seven generations. So some of the principles of division, and I'm going to go through this very quickly. Um, you know, and, and when I put these out there, educators would have already seen these. These are directly out of the uh, inclusive education policy, but every student can learn with enough time. Every student, including those with special needs, should receive full day instruction. Every student should be in a common learning environment. So again, we're speaking to a collaborative approach in schools where students are not secluded into resource rooms and learning centers and basements. And, you know, it means that much as possible, students are integrating with a variety of educational professionals. They are in the prime instructional area as much as possible. Because we can, I know that when we talk about Mi'kmaq learners in particular and African Nova Scotian learners, we know that the data shows that a lot of our children are being are outside of the main instructional area, whether it be suspension, whether it be learning center, whether it be resource room. We don't want them outside of the classroom for that amount of time. So in what ways can we make the classroom a place where all students are welcome? And, and, and so the teacher now becomes a part of a team and that team is welcome into the prime instructional area where inclusive education happens. And again, uh, I really appreciate SLA um, as a whole because many of the breakout sessions that are happening today and even in the pre-conference are talking about MTSS, CRP, UDL, all the different ways that we can incorporate and be inclusive with our education, educational practices rather than exclusive. You go here, you go here, you go there. And so that's a big change for our system and it's an improvement for our system that we listen to students' voices. It's ironic, I remember I was the manager of student experience at a university, and after about eight months of being in that job, I realized that most of the tables I sat at, there weren't any students there. It was adults pontificating about what they thought students needed. So first voice is very important, and we've already started to, through some of the work of Kim Matheson and, and our data collection um, uh, um, part of the um, Department of Education, we started to ask surveys, wellness surveys, around how students are doing and getting their voices. I know that we're starting to develop an anti-racism, anti-discrimination module that also went first voice and asked students how they felt about racism, discrimination, homophobia, um, the fact that they don't speak English as their first language. And we got first voice um, feedback. So we now know with an inclusive environment, getting the voice of the people that we serve, AKA the students, because I would say that we are not improving until the students say we're improving. We are not improving until parents say we are improving. We are not improving until the community says we are improving. Teachers can't say to themselves, we're improving. Administrators can't say to teachers, we're improving. Th that's not the, way you, the impact. We have to judge improvement on the people that we are looking to impact. So that's the 120,000 students. So when the 120,000 students are saying, especially the marginalized, underserved students, are starting to say, you want to know what? School's better for me. I'm doing better in school. I like school better. I feel more supported in school. That's when we're making progress. So student's voice really matters. Every student deserves to belong, especially, of course, culturally and linguistically. And it's a strength-based approach. So when you see a student in a wheelchair, they have a lot of strengths that they bring to the table. And you have to make sure that you're thinking and envisioning all of the students that come through your building for their strengths. We all know we have weaknesses, including the adults that are on this session today. We all have weaknesses. But yet, we would like even our spouses, our children, to see our strengths first. So a strength-based approach is also part of an inclusive approach. And then lastly, all partners are committed and empowered to work collectively. So there's something about a school system that works together. So all of the supports, including African Nova Scotian support workers, Mi'kmaq support workers, speech pathologists, um, uh, um, social workers, vice principals, principals, the cafeteria, the janitors, 
everyone is working together for this vision. So this is a collective vision um, of a school system that works with all of the adults working together to serve the children. So I've got about five more minutes and then I'm going to open it up um, to, I'll stop sharing and I'll open it up to discussion. But how do we get there? And this is just a quick chart. Let's start at the bottom, self-reflection. I have many privileges as a male, six foot one male, able-bodied, English speaking, three university degrees, heterosexual. And when I say that, heterosexual means I can hold my partner's hand. I can show a public display of affection to my partner. And, and, and because we're, we're not a same-sex couple, there's very little fear of repro being reprimanded. But yet, so there are privileges that come with my life. I need to self-reflect on those privileges before I do anything as a teacher. And not self-reflect in a way of trying to defend, because I know many people, when they hear the white word white privilege, they think, oh, well, that, I'm offended by that. But again, if we flip it to stats, if we're saying that the Mi'kmaq student population is 6% and the African Nova Scotian population is 6%, that means they're around 94%. There's your privilege. If 94% of the students and the teachers in Nova Scotia are of European descent, there is a privilege to that. Same way in Jamaica, if 98% of the administrators and teachers and students are of color, they're of African descent, there is a privilege to that. And so you don't have to um, defend and be, a, be afraid by the word privilege. I think we need to self-reflect and see the biases and blind spots that we have before we can even start to listen to students and community. Then the next arrow is be open to listening and learning. I've been in meetings where I can tell the people that we were suggesting diversity to, inclusion to, were not open to the conversation. You could tell by their body language. You could tell by their responses. You could tell by the amount of barriers that they put. Oh, we can't do that. Oh, we can't do that. That's not the way to go. Are you sure you're right about that? Like, those type of ways are being closed-minded. So if you self-reflect and then you're open-minded, then the next level is being, uncomfort being comfortable outside of your comfort zone. So the parent and the student that you didn't get along with, you have to get along with them somehow. You have to build that relationship. Communities that you never went into, that the kids that come from that community, whether it's from socioeconomics, whether it's culturally, whatever, you don't feel comfortable. And that's, again, self-reflection. Be honest with yourself. If you don't feel comfortable, then you can't teach in an inclusive fashion. So you need to work on being comfortable phoning parents that may be angry with you that may feel like, and, and as soon as you talk to them the first time, they may give you an energy that makes you feel uncomfortable. But I would guarantee you that if you listen to them and you honor them and you're open, that tone will change. And after continuous building of an authentic relationship, you will then be able to talk to that parent and then be able to teach that child. So again, once you're outside your comfort zone, now you can collaborate and build solid, authentic relationships. And then finally, that means that we can now focus on the academic achievement and wellness for all students. So now because we self-reflected and we know that we have biases and we know that we have privileges and we know that we may have to be outside our comfort zone to accommodate um, students and parents and communities that don't look like us, don't talk like us, don't live like us. When we do that, now the table's set for us to offer an education educational environment that's open to everyone. So again, this is just a short, and then we go back to self-reflect again, be open again, be uncomfortable again, collaborate again, focus on academic um, achievement and wellness again, and it's a continuous cycle. And so, in, in, and if you look in the next graphic, I do not have enough arrows, and I put this together, my graphic ability is weak, but if the student's in the center, then, it's almost a web of how the student has to be connected to support staff and the teacher and administration and the parents and the teacher also, I can have an arrow that goes over to the parent, goes like, so everyone has to be connected in this relational web because it takes a village to raise a child. And I would say that in all of our communities, the most important building beside, beyond the hospital, beyond the rec center, beyond the church, beyond the dentist office, beyond the shopping mall, beyond the grocery store, 
The most important building in every community is the school building. Because that's where we are bringing up adults. That's where we are doing social emotional learning. That is where other students are, where students and children and youth are learning about other cultures, other ways, other viewpoints. So when we do, so a school is a very important part of the village. And so all we're saying with the inclusive education policy is that we behave village like within the school building. So often your teachers say, oh, the ratio is one to 35 in class sizes. Well, if you add the student support workers and the resource teachers and the EAs and the learning center teachers, if you add all of the supports that are in your building and you utilize them, then your ratio is not one to 35. And it's not one to 25. The more adults that you welcome into your classroom who are professionals, who can add to the situation, who could assist you in a village manner, in an inclusive manner, it means that we're now bringing up a diverse population of children because we're using a diverse population of adults to accommodate those children. So with about, you know, we're at about 14 minutes left and I am going to open up is that again, and I said it, that education, I love being a teacher. I will always be a teacher. I love educators and I have full respect for everyone on this call and in the SLA who in their summertime are, are thinking about students and thinking about curriculum and thinking about pedagogy because we can change the world. So when we look at Black Lives Matter and the Me Too movement and um, trans and queer identity, um, uh, treaty rights, um, uh, uh, residential school, all those learnings, the number one place that we can change society is inside of school buildings. The most powerful place to change society is inside of school buildings if we do it inclusively. So I know that is 45 minutes of me um, talking. Uh, in this platform, it was, I found it was better because as far as me interacting, I can't do jam boards and breakouts. So I've, I've basically been talking, but again, I'm going to open up now um, to any questions, insights, concerns um, based on the presentation. And I also want to thank those that took an hour out of their summertime um, and, and for those that are continuing on to sessions, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. I, I, I know how important educators are. I have a great love for the educational system. And I think that this inclusive vision is something that can, can accommodate all. It is not an easy vision. It's not going to be an easy road. But I think it is that improvement road that we could lead the country in saying that, no, no, we're going to try to accommodate all students. All means all. Thank you so much, Augie. We've been uh, very lucky to have had you leading this work and uh, continuing to lead it as we move forward. Uh, there has been one question in the chat so far. So Tara asks, it's so important for all students to see themselves in their learning. How do you think the education field can, can attract a more diverse workforce? That's a that's a great question, Tara. And I think that um, part of it, we I know in the EECD, we've had many conversations recently around the hiring process because again, it's got to look different. If you want to attract a diverse um, uh, population of, of of professionals, then you may have to, for example, you can work with ISANs. You can work with uh, um, the Mi'kmaq community has many places where they're networking. To, to bring, to, to showcase jobs. The African Nova Scotian community has that. The disability community has that around, here's adults that could work in the school system, maybe what you see is underserved or, or in a minority position. And so I think that we're really starting to um, uh, advertise jobs in different ways. Um, to designate um, certain jobs um, as needing diversity. Um, some people may say, oh, they're against that, but that's after decades of not seeing diversity, then sometimes you have to mandate things in order for that change to start to happen. And if you do mandate, hopefully in a couple decades, you don't need a mandate anymore because diverse hiring happens naturally. But at this point, it doesn't. So I, I do think to that question is, is that you've got to be really purposeful in how you reach out to community, these diverse communities, in order to um, 
let the adults know that it's safe to work at HRCE. It's safe to work at Tri-County. It's safe to work at the Department of Ed. And to be honest, and I'm only speaking from the African Nova Scotian community, it's not always seen as a safe place with these jobs. It's not. So we have to build that connection with community that says that we are ready and willing and open to diverse hires. And then when you get here, we're going to ensure that you don't walk into a toxic environment. We're going we're gonna to onboard you and have you work in a situation that is also good for your own wellness and good for your own um, um, professional progress. Thanks, Augie. The next question uh, is from Amanda. I'm going to summarize a little bit. Um, she's had some challenging discussions as a sub with some of her classes while trying to represent diversity and is wondering what's the best way to manage the loud privilege that often tries to take control of inclusive conversations we try to have in our classrooms? Yeah, that, that Again, Amanda, that's a great question because when we talk about the percentages, if we're talking about the majority of students being of European descent, um, but I think that what I will say is that this particular group of students who are in the cyber age um, really know more about diversity than, than I did growing up in the 80s. And so there's a real um, uh, narrowing of the viewpoint that would be um, uh, white supremacist or misogynist or xenophobic towards um, uh, people who are not from Canada or immigrating, I think that that is shrinking. So partly I find when I do the diversity work and any teacher that's doing that is own your own privilege in front of the students, um, be vulnerable in front of the students, uh, and, and, and do not get angry at their narrow vision that they may have sometimes. Um, people grow just like plants um, at different pace. And so it may not be that you have to solve everything in that one half an hour or 90 minutes with that grade seven class. Maybe you're laying a seed to a student that really challenged you the whole day. And then maybe that seed grows that they take a course or they see a movie or they end up having a conversation with a friend. And a month later, that seed that you planted at a sub as a substitute teacher grows into a new perspective. And so I think that I would just um, caution that people be patient with cultural change and, and asking people to change their thinking. It's hard to get someone not to go to the same Tim Hortons and change their Tim Hortons behavior in the morning. So humans changing their behavior and changing their thinking is not an easy thing to do. And so be aware of that complexity theory, change theory, have the conversation, lay the seed, be positive, own your own privileges, and then just let it lay as it lays. And hopefully that seed will, will grow into an inclusive plant that, that, that has that 13-year-old that challenged you being an 18-year-old that gets it. Thanks. I think we have time for one more question here. So Julia is asking, how can you encourage colleagues who are finding it challenging to understand how crucial inclusive ed, CRP, and trauma-informed practices are? Well, what comes to my mind is customer service because, again, um, if you're looking around your classrooms and you see diversity, then I would boomerang the question back to those colleagues and say, you know, one of the things, if we focus on student learning and if we focus on accommodating students, because often educational power has been with teachers, it's definitely been with administrators. I would suggest to you that the inclusive education policy vision puts the power in the student with the student. And yes, we are the professionals, we are the adults, we are the leaders. But when we look around, there's diversity within diversity. So even if you have a class of all white students, that does not mean that there's not um, diversity within that class. So I often use this vision of an iceberg. We only see the tip of the iceberg of every single student we meet. We don't even know what's underneath. So whether the student's Mi'kmaq, whether the student's Francophone, whether the student's Syrian, uh, like whether the student has mental health, it doesn't matter. We have to get to know them better. So part of um, what I would say to, to colleagues who find it challenging, I hate to be blunt, but I would say to them, do your job. Do your job. Your job is to accommodate all learners. 
So when when you're hearing about CRP and trauma-informed and treaty education, these are all concepts that have been brought up by community, that have been spoken about by students saying that they would like to have these things as a part of the education system. And what's great about it, it's not only Indigenous students who are saying that treaty education has to be there. It's not only black students who would like CRP. Matter of fact, Dr. Shiraki Holly says that CRP is for all students. The only reason it seems to resonate with African Nova Scotian and Mi'kmaq students here is because that's the group that struggles the most in the school system. But culturally re relevant pedagogy applies to all students. Right. So I think that teachers have to rethink what their job is. And if they rethink their job that they have to accommodate every student, then I think their lack of understanding inclusive ed, the lack of accepting it comes to scope that it's not just for you to be the curriculum giant and the curriculum leader to come in and, and have all the power and say, well, I put the curriculum out there and only certain kids got it. No, no. You have to make sure that all children get it. That's our job. Same way an electrician has to wire up every house and a dentist has to do everybody's teeth and a doctor has to do surgery on everybody. So right now, the atmosphere in Nova Scotia is that all teachers have to accommodate all students. It's professionalism. Thank you, Augie. We've got about two minutes here to wrap up. So I'm going to thank you for this very informative talk and kicking us off into three days of uh, learning and collaborating around inclusive education in diverse contexts. Uh, we'd invite all of you to join us again for our next set of sessions starting at 11 uh, and remind you that if you're having any trouble, we have a few help options listed in the lobby and we look forward to uh, seeing you and learn, uh, learning with you for the rest of the week. Thank you so much, Lael, Sandy, and your group. You guys do a fantastic job. And, and I just want to say, I know the amount of hours you put into this, Lael, and you've been a great colleague for me. Whenever I needed help, you were there with a smile, with your intelligence, and you made things that seemed so hard become so easy for me as far as tech. So I want to thank you for that. And I want to wish everyone a beautiful summer. Um, thanks for spending time and taking an hour out of your day. I so appreciate it. And uh, again, I don't have the answers. I'm not an expert. I just hope I provoke some thought. Thank you and see you soon.